In 2019, ESA's presence in space will continue with a second long-duration mission for Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano aboard the International Space Station ISS. During the second half of the mission, which is named Beyond, Luca will become the third ESA astronaut to serve as commander of the ISS and the first Italian to do so. He will launch on a Soyuz alongside NASA astronaut Andrew Morgan and Russian cosmonaut Alexander Svortskov from Baikonur this summer. In parallel, preparations for the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle are underway at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This will be NASA's new capsule for deep space exploration. In this project, NASA has entrusted ESA with the development of a critical element for the Orion spacecraft, its service module. The European service module will provide propulsion, power and cooling for the capsule during its first unmanned trip around the Moon in 2020. In autumn, a new science mission called KEOPS, or Characterizing Exoplanet, will be launched from Kourou on top of a Soyuz. It's the first mission dedicated to studying exoplanets with ultra-high precision photometry on bright stars already known to host such planets. KEOPS will measure the precise sizes of planets larger than Earth and smaller than Saturn in order to determine their density, further enabling studies of their internal structure, composition, formation and evolution. For telecoms, several innovative projects in partnership with industry and satellite operators will be launched. EDRSC will complete the European Data Relay System this summer. This Airbus Space Data Highway uses laser communications to transmit big data to Earth in near real time. LuxSpace's automatic identification system microsatellite will provide ship detection and maritime anti-collision services, while the first all-electric space bus NEO platform with Thales Alenia Space will supply broadband to Europe and Africa. UTELSAT Quantum will mark a first as the world's only software-defined satellite. Meanwhile, ESA continues to secure independent access to space for Europe. With the first flight of the small satellite's mission service dispenser on a Vega rocket, ESA will demonstrate the capacity to launch multiple micro-satellites together for both institutional and commercial needs. At the European spaceport in French Guiana, preparation is underway for the first launch of Vega C, a version of the Vega rocket with enhanced payload capacity. It will use a new and more powerful first stage, the P120C. This same motor will also be used as solid rocket boosters for Ariane 6, future European heavy lift launcher with a consolidated space transportation system that will allow to launch any satellite in any orbit, ESA can envisage to go further in space. This will be discussed in November during Space 19 Plus, ESA's council at ministerial level in Seville, Spain. ESA will propose to its member states a complete portfolio, science and exploration, space safety and security, applications and access to space. With Space 19 Plus, the European Space Agency has the ambition to acquire the means for a bold future, for a strong Europe in space. Good morning to everybody and uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, health and whatever you need for success for your personal. I will uh, report right now about uh, some of the activities um, and it will be a mixture of 18, 19 and beyond. So this is the idea. Uh, and of course I start with a very recent message, you all got it from yesterday, uh, Brexit. Uh, we don't know what is really going on. Um, this is really a question also for us. Um, we as an intergovernmental organization, we know and we have a clear commitment of UK to remain an ESA member state. But as everything is now unclear, we also uh, have some questions. Uh, we have some certainty in this and that respect. We have some other questions 
And just to tell you that uh, we, and this means the directors who are here today also uh, for the first time all together at, at such an event, um, and myself, we are right now looking into all, to all the different details um, which may come up with the Brexit to be prepared for different scenarios. 2018, there was a list of Europe's top 50 women in tech. So just what is the message? The message is Magali is in it. Uh, and therefore, uh, we are very happy. And uh, by that, I would like to mention also that uh, some weeks ago, I got the confirmation of the ESA Council of the extensions of uh, the team of teams, as I call it. That means uh, all the directors are extended. Except, unfortunately, I was fighting like hell with uh, Magali to uh, keep her in, but uh, 12 years, she is now for 12 years next year, that means uh, in 2020, not now, but in 2020, she, she will reach 20, uh, 12 years of being director, and this is according to our rules, a limit, and I could not convince her to make an exception. I'm sure the, the member states would do it, but that means uh, the team as it is right now will remain until 2020, but then we will um, have uh, to look uh, also for a successor for uh, Magali. All the other teams, uh, the other members of the teams are confirmed. Another thing happened last year. We got an award, um, especially for our work uh, with Baby Colombo and Aeolus. Uh, in, the, in the category of government agencies of the year, um, and this was a rather nice thing. But now we are looking into the future, and uh, when, I'm, when I said 2018, 2019 and beyond, that means that I will cover also some of the actions of the uh, plans for the Space 19 Plus, as we call it right now. Uh, Space 19 Plus is, of course, um, the next ministerial, so instead of uh, having, an, again, uh, a mixture of different names, CMIN19, CM19, or whatever people are inventing as that, now it has a clear name, it is Space19+. Plus. And if you look into this picture, you see from the left to the right, we have already ongoing programs from before uh, the CM16. We have, of course, uh, the... Uh, ministerial in 2016, we are implementing all the different uh, aspects, and that means we have the programs based on that. And since more than one year, we are already preparing the next ministerial. So uh, we, are, we were planning for at least two years of preparation. So we have more than one year behind us. Uh, we have a little bit less than one year in front of us. And as uh, it was said already, the Space 19 Plus will be in Sevilla, in Spain, under the Spanish presidency of ESA. And we are right now planning all of this. Um, to prepare it, we had a very special event, the so-called Intermediate Ministerial Meeting uh, in 2018 in um, Madrid at our location, uh, ESAC, and uh, in that uh, there were some very important decisions, so there were ma more or less three main topics on the agenda. The first one was the so-called DG's proposal, a united Europe in space, so you see I'm moving this wording, not only saying united space in Europe, but also the other way around, united Europe in space. Um, we uh, had papers concerning ESA's role in uh, especially in the relation with the European Union. And we also looked for strategic guidelines for the preparation of the ESA, ESA um, programs and activities. And we got a confirmation of the member states and a clear mandate, for instance, especially for the relation with the European Union. You know that uh, we have the situation that with the Lisbon Treaty, the European Union is also entering into the space sector. But it's clear that there is, should be uh, appropriate relations between uh, European Union, European Commission and ESA, and whatever appropriate relations means has to be based on some very clear uh, definitions. So if from the left to the right in this picture you see the ESA Convention, you see the Framework Agreement of 2004 between uh, EU and ESA, you see the Lisbon Treaty, that's the upper line, on the lower line, left, 
the joint statement between EU and ESA from 2016, and of course also the regulation of the EU, which is still under discussion, but of course um, the finalization is uh, now very close, and um, uh, we have to see how we can put all of this together. And one important thing for that is the so-called FFPA, Financial Framework Partnership Agreement between the European Commission and ESA. And um, this part uh, was discussed in the IMM and the member states gave me a clear mandate to discuss and mm -hmm. negotiate all of this with the European Commission. And internally we are preparing it right now to then when the regulation is at a certain point um, clear that we can then also have some agreements with the European Commission about how and what we should do. All of this is, of course, still under what I mentioned uh, already some two years ago, the space 4.0. This is and remains a very clear uh, activity. It is covering what is called the new space, the Internet of Things. It also participation, which is uh, right now also discussed in, in other areas, but uh, you see that this all of this is still the basis and will remain the basis because it gives us a very sound uh, information of how we can behave and how we should behave. But this means not only to go forward, but it means also to, to look into ESA as such. We made a uh, SWOT analysis of ESA and this was also shown to the member states at the IMM with clear measures, and again, a mandate was given to me uh, to develop ESA in this direction to make it uh, what we could say more agile, more efficient, but also more effective. So efficiency and eff effectiveness both are important. Transparency, accountability, these are buzzwords, um, but we are really filling them. That means uh, we are filling them in our visions, in our programs, in our processes, the different management tools and the organization. And this picture is uh, chosen to say self-similarity, meaning that we are trying to be also um, to the outer world more simple to understand. So, of course, you know ESA, fine. The big companies know ESA, fine, but there are more people in the world than just you and the industrialists. There are small and medium-sized enterprises, there are citizens, there are politicians, and therefore I think it's very important that we are self-similar in our different programs, that we can really give a narrative to what we are doing and how we are doing it. And it is changing, this world is changing because we have more instruments. This, is a little bit reflecting also the discussion of Internet of Things and um, what is called in the US new space. Of course we will have still traditional projects. This is a, is a very successful story of ESA as an agency, but we are now looking into very new types. And when I say very new types, I call open concepts and turnkey projects, which uh, so far was not the main aspect of what ESA was doing. Public-private partnership and public-public partnership, this is already a tradition in ESA uh, and a successful tradition. So just to give you a small feeling of what I'm saying, to, from the left to the right, you see Aeolus, which was mentioned already in the clip, um, a very innovative uh, satellite. It was procured in the more traditional way, but very innovative contents-wise success. Then we have Neosat, next generation platform for, um, for telecommunication satellites. It is public-private partnership uh, where we have some tradition and its success. And right now we are in a new phase in parallel. And again, we don't say this and that is the magic formula for everything, but we are looking always in the different areas where is the best instrument, and this is in-orbit servicing and debris removal, where we are looking uh, to a, even to a, a step ahead, where we are looking to something like public-private partnership, but also uh, requesting at the very beginning that industry gives us some information about what their business case for the project is, in which way they are doing it, um, and uh, we will come back to that, if you like, uh, in detail. Uh, no, I have to say, and that means that also the role of ESA is changing. Yes, we are a space agency. We are very happy to be a European space agency. But for other programs, we might be partner. 
this is public-private partnership. We might be even sometimes only a broker. You say only, I say only. But what I mean is that we are putting together interests and activities of different entities, let's assume different industrial partners, without our own money, without our uh, investment, but as we have a very strong network uh, Europe-wide plus worldwide, we can be um, a broker, a mediator, facilitator or enabler of uh, different activities. And this means also that we are looking to the industrial landscape. Uh, this is in our, in our blood, so to say, in our genes. It is in our convention, and our convention is our genes. So um, in our convention, it's clearly said that ESA should take responsibility for a European industrial landscape. And this means the full landscape. Uh, starting with uh, small and medium, or even entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized enterprises, but also big companies. And the question and the important thing is to have a sound structure of suppliers of different sizes and the so-called large, uh, large system integrators. And that means uh, that we are looking into industrial policy and of course, uh, it is important to have a sound overall configuration of the small ones, the big ones, the medium ones, the startups. Um, but all of this has to be done in fair competition. To increase this, we have some instruments, as I mentioned, for the small and medium sized enterprises uh, already. Uh, and we are now having also some partnership with the European Investment Bank to um, combine our technical uh, capability with their financial instruments, they have to give loans, for instance, to industry um, uh, to cover some special uh, interest of the companies. We had also in the IMM, I announced it at the IMM, and meanwhile we realized it, a downstream gateway. A downstream gateway should be one space to the customer. This is the wording, and you will see that I'm using more than this one word for defining something in a more narrative way to give a little bit better feeling what we mean. So one space to the customer means that we have a gateway where people from outside, whatever outside means, can enter into ESA or can get with information out of ESA. So a two-way gateway. Um, and this gateway is covering all the different um, activities of ESA, all the different um, areas, uh, which I will explain in a minute again, science and exploration, safety and security, applications enabling and support. And so we uh, announced it in the IMM and uh, we installed it. Meanwhile, so this downstream gateway is existing. Now, what we are planning for the future, of course, it could be done by the Director General according to the convention. That would be the, the simple way to do it. Uh, we could enhance it a little bit and say, OK, we talk with the directors and plan the uh, future. But our understanding is also most of our satellites are in flying in vacuum. We are not developing in vacuum. We are developing on ground um, by having dialogues with very various difficult, different players, our delegations, of course, industry, of course, politics, but also citizens. And this is a very broad participation. If you remember, it was uh, said in the picture of um, uh, Space 4.0, participation is an important point, And we are developing our programs by taking into account the opinions of these different share and stakeholders. Um, and this means also we had the space talks uh, in, at the end of last year, and you will get today uh, also results of a poll uh, which was uh, done uh, Europe-wide um, with uh, the five big countries um, to see a little bit more what is expected from the citizens what we should do. So it's really uh, taking care of all of these different aspects. Yes, it's clear. We have global challenges, and um, space can tackle all of these global challenges. Uh, you see the traditional way of global challenges, like climate change, or mobility, or um, uh, energy. But there is also curiosity. As I always mentioned, curiosity is the strongest driver of humankind. And ESA and space uh, is delivering very important things for that. Information, communication, science, technology, education, and inspiration. Now, how to do this? Again, 
this, is, uh, this was changed during the last year in a narrative how to explain it better to the public. This is a narrative. I always have to repeat it several times because people forget that I'm saying it's a narrative. It's a narrative, meaning it is not an, a structuring thing within ESA. It is a narrative how to show and explain what we are doing. And these are the so-called four main programmatic pillars. From the left to the right, science and exploration. And if you, you are aware of what ESA is doing, then you know already science is mandatory program, exploration is an optional program. You see, it's not a program, it's not a program this pillar. It's a narrative, and there are different parts in it. The se second one is safety and security. I will come back to that because it's a new pillar as such. Applications covering Earth observation, navigation and telecommunication, and then enabling and support, which of course includes uh, the launchers, but it also includes operations and uh, new technology developments. So what is space today? Space today is infrastructure and more. When I say infrastructure, it's clear. Through space, we can deliver. We can deliver results of research, we can do research, we can deliver observations of the Earth, we can even do also uh, geopolitical activities, so space is an infrastructure. And if you look to an infrastructure, infrastructure needs innovation, infrastructure, infrastructure needs an installation, it needs continuity, blah, 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 all of this, and it needs also extension. This is very common for all the other types of infrastructures, railways, roads, uh, or even uh, harbors. But now, just think about that also space is an infrastructure, and as an infrastructure, it has to be maintained and further developed. Now I go through the different activities, and because the narrative is saying science and exploration, safety and security, applications enabling and support, I follow this narrative without looking to whether it's mandatory, optional, whether it's an individual program, or whatever it is. First, science. Science, of course, is the backbone of ESA. It is in the convention, uh, a program which is mentioned in the convention, which is also handled in a very special way um, in uh, ESA. And science has many things. One thing was and is Gaia. Gaia is an excellent mission, and uh, we got a lot of uh, results and a lot of publications, so the Gaia um, uh, Gaia data is uh, really something which is uh, loved in the world. Many publications on the day of the opening of the publication of the data, a huge amount of, of publications uh, were already uh, coming out. We have also the, the case of uh, launches, of course, all the time. This time it is the launch of uh, Bepi Colombo. I always like to see launches, therefore I put it here in as just as an example. Uh, Bepi Colombo was launched um, uh, in uh, October last year, and um, Bepi Colombo is electric mobility with a little bit more of possibility than normal cars only. It, it will go for 9 billion kilometers without uh, having uh, go to a special station to recharge the batteries, because it has solar panels. And therefore, the solar panels were for us very important that they are deployed. So on the right-hand side, you see that the solar panels are deployed. That was the first selfie of, um, um, of Bepi Colombo. And it's on its way to Mercury. It will take seven years, a long ride. Um, and it is a really a fantastic mission with three spacecrafts at the same time. Uh, one more or less uh, the, the driving force, the engine, that's uh, the first one in this picture on the left-hand side. Then we have the European satellite in the middle and then a Japanese satellite on top of it. So it's three uh, spacecraft at the same time which are flying to Mercury. And here you see already a, another point in the direction. Whenever you see this uh, in yellow, uh, the yellow letters, you see that this is uh, a sentence, a narrative, 
which goes to the Space 19 Plus, uh, bringing sound to the cosmic movies. Uh, what it is meant is that we are trying to combine, for instance, in space um, uh, some two missions, which so far were seen to be competitors, but we try to have both at the same time in order to give some additional value. Uh, so Athena, uh, looking to hot gas structures and supermassive black holes, and Lisa, uh, gravitational wave observations. And by putting both together, the results of both together, we hope for some better understanding of our universe. And it was mentioned in the movie already in the clip, Cheops will be launched uh, hopefully in October this year. Uh, it is also part of a longer story. It, uh, it will look to exoplanets um, in the size of Earth to Neptune, but then we have Plato and Ariel later on, uh, which are looking more to the uh, to, uh, exoplanets, uh, so it's a long-ranging activity we have. And we have uh, this year also um, a new multi-messenger excitement by putting together data from other uh, satellites. You know that 2019 is called the International Year of the Periodic Table. And we have some uh, additional information from ground-based uh, instruments, LIGO. But we will uh, also look to, from our point of view, then with XMM Newton still active and integral into space to get better information and better understanding. So, to talk about uh, science, I could talk for hours, uh, I will not do that. Here are just a few of the uh, upcoming missions so far, some of them already launched, Pepe Colombo, as I mentioned. Uh, and there is uh, something we are looking also far in the future, and this is a joint mission with NASA to go to the icy planets. Um, there is a very special constellation um, in about 10 years or something like 15 years between Jupiter, Neptune, and Uranus. And by that, you can go really a fast track uh, to Neptune and Uranus. And uh, therefore, this planetary conjunction we would like to use together with NASA, because the only time uh, Uranus and Neptune were visited is already uh, several years back uh, from Voyager 2, which was launched in 1977. So with today's instruments, with today's possibilities, we may learn more about these uh, ice giants, which are very important. Still in the first pillar, exploration. Uh, exploration, ExoMars is for us day-to-day uh, -day work, uh, because the 2016 mission uh, is success, is uh, uh, still working and has to work, because we need it as a relay station also for the 2020 mission, the rover. Um, we had some impressive activities last year, also from operational point of view, because to do error breaking uh, is something uh, to use the atmosphere of uh, Mars to come to the right orbit. I'm always looking to the directors in between whether I say the wrong word or the right word. Otherwise, you have to correct me because they should know the, the right word, not the words of the director general. Um, and um, so this error breaking was also important to come to some scientific activities already now, and you see here some of the nice pictures of uh, the trace gas orbiter. So it is working, it is working very fine, but as I said, it's part of a story of the 2020 mission, um, and the landing module is uh, in in progress at Lavochkin in Russia, so uh, we visited Lavochkin to see that it is really going on. Now this is uh, ExoMars, this is a robotic mission, on the uh, human mission side, um, Alexander Gerst, he was a commander of Expedition 57, um, and uh, then he handed over uh, his commandership to the next one. He came home, uh, but before he came home, one can say that he did a lot of experiments, um, uh, very many and uh, very successful. Of course, he was a little bit disturbed by some uh, activities, the mishap of the Soyuz uh, launch, uh, which a little bit postponed some of his experiment, but overall one can say he was very successful. And instead of showing you a very traditional picture of landing, I show you this one. Uh, after I go this with the uh, research areas, I have to mention this one, I want to mention it. We launched also uh, the possibility now for doing um, commercial activities on board of the station. We have the ice cubes, as you know, and we have the Bartolomeo activity. 
for ice cubes, this is now ready for use for industry, so everything is on board, so it can be done. But as I said, instead of showing you the traditional landing pictures, I t took this one, because this is part of the traditional um, uh, process uh, which happened after landing. And so uh, here you see Alexander Gerst, and uh, we had the pleasure to bring him them back to Europe. Um, the Americans brought him to Norway, and we then from Norway to Cologne to the Astronaut Center, and uh, he was in really in excellent shape. One can say that was impressive, uh, Dave, to see him walking around. Uh, it was very slippery uh, at the airport in Bordeaux, and he helped us not to, to fall down, so that was the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> so this was uh, uh, a success story. The success story is going on, um, and we are preparing the European service module for the SLS uh, launch system for the Orion. And also, it was last year that we could deliver the first module uh, to Kennedy Space Center. And, and again, uh, there was a special ceremony. Uh, it was a very nice ceremony to show what the Europeans uh, are delivering. And um, the next step is, and it was mentioned, Luca Parmitano to fly in 2019. And uh, before you can have several questions about that, it's our intention to fly all of the astronauts of the 2009 selection twice. So this is uh, our plan. So we are now looking also in the future. But for that, we need also some uh, commitment from the member states for the future uh, funding of uh, ESM uh, after ESM 1 and 2, so that we can really have the barter element, because that's what how we are financing our launches, uh, by doing barter elements, um, and the barter elements gives us then the, the, the possibility to have astronauts in the station, plus we are financing and funding the experiments in addition. The the motto for what we are doing here, again, the narrative is once explorer, always explorers, and we have the European uh, Exploration Envelope Program, which started in 2016. I'm still very glad that it was successful to start it, which was not that easy and not expected, even not for me. Uh, but we succeeded, uh, thanks to a big uh, effort of the director, of Dave Parker. Um, and it is uh, lower orbit, Moon and Mars. These are our destinations. You see the difference. Science is looking a million and billion of light years ahead in the universe. Uh, exploration is looking uh, to reachable um, uh, destinations, especially within our solar system. And uh, to do so, we have uh, the human space flight. We are um, still very much uh, planning uh, lunar landing together with the Russians. We are doing uh, Mars, especially with the Americans, and then the uh, lunar gateway. Uh, to mention a little bit about that, so the Moon Village is, of course, part of that story, but it's not an ESA project, as I always have to repeat. It's an, a concept, an open, multi-partner open concept, and if you... Uh, see that like that, then also the Chinese activities right now are part of this story, as well as some other private and public actors. So it's not back to the moon, that would mean we are repeating what happened uh, some 50 years ago in, uh, in competition, in, in uh, Cold War. It is forward to the moon, that makes a big difference. Um, and there are some, some activities already, so um, there are companies uh, which are ready to provide communication to the surface of the moon, uh, but also other activities uh, which are there. And the lunar gateway, now it's sometimes it's called only gateway, uh, is, a, is not only an American activity, it is uh, the Americans are asking regularly uh, meetings uh, with international partners, including ESA, and we are ready to contribute also parts of the lunar gateway if our member states are supporting it, and this would give us uh, possibilities also to have maybe a European on the surface of the Moon in the future. At the same time, we are looking to Mars further on. Mars simply return isn't, uh, isn't really a, a goal, because if you have samples on Earth, you can investigate them, of course, much more in detail than if you are just doing it uh, even without, with all the possibilities we have today. Uh, on site, directly in situ, um, it's uh, 
even better to have the material on Earth, and then you can really start all your labs, your machineries to investigate uh, what is uh, happening, what can be done. I move to the second pillar, which is called safety and security. Safety and security has uh, several aspects. So there is the so-called space safety on the left-hand part. This is where the threats are originated in space. Space weather, uh, debris um, near the objects. And then we have, on the right-hand side, safety and security applications where we are looking to threats originated on the surface of Earth tsunami, maritime security, and all of this, and cybersecurity as a baseline. All of this is does, done ex for exclusively peaceful purposes, as it is in our, in our um, uh, convention. Here, a little bit more detailed explanation on the left-hand side. As I mentioned, uh, space weather, debris, planetary defense, and uh, collisions avoidance autonomy and we are looking forward to have this as a single program, as a new envelope program for space safety. Not easy, but we try to convince our member states for that. On the right-hand side, the safety and security applications, this is within several programs. It's in Earth observation, it's in navigation, it's in telecommunication in the different area, and it covers maritime uh, security, disaster management, uh, air traffic management, all of this, uh, even gov.com is part of that narrative on the right-hand side. And cybersecurity of all the activities is, of course, a quality assurance measure, and therefore we are looking forward to have this in our what is called basic activities. Just an example to make clear what I mean, if I'm looking to uh, safety and security applications, you know this picture most probably is a uh, automatic identification system signals uh, covered, uh, uh, covering the whole world. Uh, all the ships which have uh, AIS signal, they are recorded. But by comparing this data with data of, of either optical or radar uh, satellites, you can make a, a match and if something is does not have a signal but is there, then you can, uh, for maritime security, you may have a better view, a better understanding. Um, concerning the uh, debris, we are looking for several things. We are looking for, first of all, of course, uh, tracking. Number two, we are looking for uh, uh, removal. And number three, to uh, avoid uh, to the production of few further space debris. And this picture is uh, where we would like to avoid a future um, uh, space debris by avoiding um, uh, collisions with an autonomous system based on artificial intelligence. The uh, vacuum cleaner, also, uh, I know it's uh, not so easy, it's for German, it's very clear to understand what I mean, uh, but the British will understand what the hell is vacuum cleaner, it doesn't work in, in vacuum, but it should clean the vacuum, that's the idea, it should clean the vacuum, that's uh, the wording. So um, it should do in-orbit servicing and debris removal, and this is a very special activity we started last year. Uh, with some request of information to uh, industry. And now we are down-selecting these uh, ideas and we will come up uh, at the end with a clear proposal to our member states how to do it. And uh, the motto for that is stay clean. The top story today remains last week's discovery of an asteroid as big as a city block that is heading for Earth and, according to initial predictions, is forecast to hit somewhere between Tokyo and Copenhagen just 24 days from now. Simulations indicate the impact will provide enough energy to destroy a city. Okay, understood the message. We are trying to play billiard in space uh, together with the Americans. The Americans are heading towards a small uh, body which is called Didi Moon uh, uh, of Didi Moss, an asteroid, and we are planning to have, uh, you remember AIM, we did not give up our AIMs, so we are trying to uh, have uh, HERA as, uh, to observe uh, what happened after the impact. And then space weather, solar flares, and uh, in that respect we are looking for a space weather early warning. We, were, we are planning uh, to uh, propose to the member states a mission which goes to L5, 
the uh, Langrange point five because from there you can have a very nice view on uh, how the uh, space weather is uh, hitting towards the Earth and from L1 the Americans will look especially ab about the right direction. Now I come to Earth observation. You know Earth observation in ESA has uh, several different parts. It's uh, the cooperation with the European Commission, with UMITSAT, um, and um, there we have, uh, last year, we launched uh, satellites, so Sentinel-3B, part of the Copernicus fleet of Sentinels, Aeolus, I mentioned earlier, the uh, wind speed measuring satellite and METOPC uh, with UMETSAT. So uh, Aeolus is a very special uh, type of satellite measuring uh, with laser the speed of um, uh, of wind uh, globally uh, gives uh, new information also for um, uh, for all the weather forecast and uh, this is uh, maybe also a pilot for something like an operational satellite in the future. The key word for what we are doing here is health check, feeling the pulse of our planet by using the different uh, satellites, sentinels, earth explorers, medsats, uh, to really cover all the essential climate variables. This is for sure a very important part of uh, what is expected by and from ESA. We have then a satellite which we call BrainSat internally. Uh, officially it has FISAT number one, but it is BrainSat. Why BrainSat? Because it's using artificial, artificial intelligence um, for several reasons, especially also to make some pre-selection and pre-operation of the data uh, on board of the satellite already. So it's a tiny one uh, realized within a very short period and it will be launched in June this year. Uh, it's a tiny uh, nanosat uh, idea, but it, it is uh, impressive because of the new technology on board. So Copernicus is a story going on and Earth Explorers is going on, so we are uh, preparing already the next Sentinel missions in close cooperation, of course, with the European Commission. And our ESA Explorer missions are also uh, in discussion, which should be the, the next one, greenhouse effect, climate change, or ocean surface. Um, this is um, the discussion, and we are establishing right now also the long-term roadmap for Earth observation. Telecommunication. 5G is a buzzword, that's clear. 5G uh, is uh, also the future. We had uh, big achievements in the last year, uh, many projects. We had uh, the uh, EDRS-A um, uh, very active and NEOSATS, um, NEOSAT, the new uh, uh, configuration, six satellites already sold. So uh, as you know, with an artist, we are doing 100% with PPP. It's a very uh, successful uh, um, it's not only a program, it's more than a program, programs. Um, so uh, for the future, one of the narrative is optical fiber in the sky. Uh, using um, optical links uh, has several advantages, especially also with respect to security, where we combine then um, also quantum technology and optical, um, uh, optical transmission. And uh, 5G, as I said, uh, this combines then, of course, the different aspects of uh, digital sky, of further development of EDRS, and govs.com, and then um, ubiquitous uh, connectivity to the ground. Satellite navigation. Satellite navigation, and uh, still I hear that some people are talking about GPS. This word is uh, not known in ESA. Uh, we are talking either about Galileo, all about GNSS. Um, it's it's uh, GPS is just a comp uh, just a product's name. So we should talk about GNSS if we are talking about satellite navigation, or even better, talking about Galileo. Galileo is working. Galileo is uh, you can receive Galileo, um, and um, uh, just with my mobile here, you see here the uh, satellites, uh, the Galileo satellites. At that time when I. Just look to it um, on the right-hand side of this picture. So Galileo is active. Uh, you know that we had a, what was called a mishap of two satellites on the wrong orbit, and everyone was saying, ah, oh, another mishap. To be very blunt, we are not that sad about it because of two reasons. Number one, who, where is the law 
that satellites for uh, navigation uh, must be on a, uh, on a circular orbit. Is it a law? Is it in the Bible or whatever? It's not. So you can use more or less each and every orbit you have. Now you have to modify a little bit the software. But the other advantage is, by having this little bit elliptical orbit, we could prove and justify Einstein's rel general relativity theory. And this is the so-called gravitational redshift prediction, which is of utmost importance for the accuracy of the uh, satellite navigation. And we are very happy that Galileo is three times more accurate than our competitors. So therefore, it was for us a very big step forward. And again, they are not lost at all. Uh, by the way, there is another from science, uh, from the science uh, part. There is another observation, and this is a, a star circling around a dark hole. And uh, this one also gave us an additional information about the gravitational redshift, which is good uh, to have this information for uh, Galileo. So we are combining these different things. So our narrative is never lost in space. Um, and this means that we are not only looking to next generation GNSS positioning, navigation, and timing on the surface of the Earth, but also beyond, especially also to the moon. And with that, I come to space transportation. And uh, space transportation is, um, uh, of course, um, also a backbone um, to be, have an autonomous access to space. And uh, we are going forward. If you can a little bit lower down. The OK, this is uh, ILA-4, so the preparation in uh, Kourou is going on for the launch of uh, Ariane 6. And of course, also Vega C, but especially for Ariane 6, uh, everything is in preparation. So it uh, looks very nice, not only the landscape, but also all the horizontal integration building and everything is going forward. And uh, was also in the clip, so the uh, static firing test of the P120C, which we need for uh, Ariane 6 as well as for Vega C, was successful. So we are going ahead. And our uh, motto is fourth dimension of transportation, so road, ship, uh, air, and space. Um, and uh, that means that we are looking from Vega and Ariane 5 to Vega C, Ariane 6. But of course, we are looking beyond without having a concrete plan to go beyond. But we are looking beyond uh, by preparing technologies, systems, demonstrators in all the different fields, from very small launchers to big launchers from new technologies, uh, even reusability uh, is covered by that. Um, so we are looking into that. In Space 19 Plus, we will also ask for um, support for the Space Rider idea. Space Rider uh, should be a reusable microgravity um, research lab. And uh, we hope that we can uh, really get the support because we have all the tools in our hands and with a, a launcher with the spacecraft um, and reusability. I come to basic activities. Basic activities are normally not so much in the focus of all the presentations, but because I believe they are really the ones which are preparing our future. Uh, therefore, I mention them also here. We have in the, we changed a bit uh, the basic activity structure. Uh, in order to get also more support from our member state. Basic activities are part of what is called the level of resources. But as you know, there is no constant budget of ESA. All budgets, even the level of resources, have to be <laughs> committed by the member states. So a level of resources consists of the scientific program and the basic activities. In the basic activities, we try to really develop new ideas New technology, digitalization, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, all of this comes into this uh, basic activity. So it should enable the visions of the future. And we are doing this with uh, different instruments. So one is uh, the program, which is called Discovery, Preparation, and Technology Development, DBTD, um, which goes, of course, evolutionary, but also revolution and disruption. A push part and the pull part. Push part means that uh, each and everyone can apply for that and can have a new idea. And pull part means that especially the different programs are requesting some technology development and pulling some uh, innovation out of that. Uh, and by that, uh, we are doing it. 
The next step in the higher TRLs is then the GSTP, which is not in the basic activities, but uh, uh, optional program. It is also to enable the visions really to make things fly. fly. Now, just to give you some, some feelings what could be in the future there, natural disaster forecast would be very nice. We don't have it right now, but it would be nice to have it. Um, to have um, direct observation of plastic waste distribution from space. We know from the flow of the surface where the plastic waste is uh, collecting, but uh, to have a better evaluation of that would be very nice. My personal dream is urban nine distribution. We do not have a solution so far, but uh, why not looking into something which uh, cannot be done? And another thing is harbor to harbor autonomous shipping that may be also something which we can uh, <coughs> deliver uh, using the different existing and new technologies. And quantum entanglement, quantum technology, which is for quantum key distribution as well as for other activities, major possibilities. So this all should enable visions, but we need also the commercial side. So that means also on the commercial side, we have to enable commercial uh, visions. That means uh, new projects, innovative projects should uh, give them the feeling also to be really active also on a global market to be competitive. Uh, for that we need sound legal basis, uh, especially if you look to uh, uh, in, uh, in situ resource utilization and even mining. We have the partnership agreement, uh, partnership instruments, some of them existing, some of them are further developed and you see this is covering all our different areas where we are active. And finally, not so, uh, not to understand, uh, not to forget, is to enable also visionaries, and this we can do uh, with our technology, but especially with our astronauts. Now, I was always asked, what about the financial situation? And I give you this p picture for that. If you look, look to Europe, the civil space budget around 10 billion euro. If you combine. ESA, if you combine the European Union, national activities, etc. It's about 10 billion euro and about 500 million people. Now look to the US. The US, the number is not clear. It is even uh, NASA has alone more than 20 billion, but you have NOAA, you have USGS, you have other players in the civil space, um, and they have about 320 million. Uh, citizen. So if you divide that, you come up to about 20 euro per citizen in, and per year in Europe, and you come up to about 62 uh, million, uh, 62 uh, dollars per citizen in the US. Again, in the US, this number is the lowest number one could mention. With that, I stop my presentation. I'm happy to have now discussions. You can ask whatever you would like to ask. If I cannot answer this, the directors are here, and I'm sure they <coughs> will be ready and happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. So um, just as a information, there, there was a lot of information in this presentation, and uh, we are organizing a replay, uh, which will be available on our uh, website, so you, you'll be able to uh, um, catch up some of the things you may have uh, missed in the presentation. But still, uh, we have a bit more than half an hour exchange here, so anyone who would like to start, uh, again, please introduce yourself. Yes, please. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Dmitry Orlov. Uh, I'm uh, from uh, Russian news agency TASS. Uh, could you please uh, give uh, a more broad comment uh, on the Chinese mission on the moon and uh, also give uh, um, uh, some prospects uh, of uh, uh, EU and uh, Russian uh, future mission on the moon? Uh, what, uh, what answer do you prepare for Chinese? So, uh, the Chinese mission, congratulation. Uh, we con I send the congratulations to the Chinese colleagues. It is, it is always uh, an achievement to land on another body, moon or planet. I think it is, yeah, it is a nice achievement. Um, we had and we have 
intensive interactions also with our Chinese colleagues in different ways, uh, operations, uh, but also discussions about future cooperation. Um, so therefore, it is for us uh, an interesting uh, country of uh, interaction. The mission as such is interesting because it has for the first time uh, also a rover on the far side. So the landing as such on, on, on the far side for me personally is just another landing. Uh, you need a relay station to, to get the results, but the, the, the landing must be aut uh, autonomous anyhow. So therefore, but the rover to have there, and I'm sure that the Chinese colleagues will share their results with us. Um, you mentioned uh, EU. Russia, I would say either Russia, because it's, uh, I, ca I can't answer the question for the EU, but for us, Russia is a very uh, stable partner, and I would like to ask, to, to answer Dave, to give some more information about what is going on with Russia, and uh, in exploration especially. Please, Dave. Dave Parker, Director for Human and Robotic Exploration. Good morning, everyone. Um, to answer the question about cooperation uh, between uh, Russia and ESA and exploration. So, first of all, we're, of course, we have a continuing cooperation aboard the uh, International Space Station. Today, we're using Soyuz vehicles uh, to get our astronauts to the space station, and that will be the case for Luca Parmitano's mission this year in July. In terms of robotic exploration, we have uh, a cooperation focused on uh, robotic lunar landers. Uh, so the first step is the mission that uh, Russia calls Luna 25, where, uh, which is a, 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 um, uh, the first Russian lunar lander since the historic Soviet era. Uh, also Luna 26, which is an orbiter, and Luna 27, which is a precision lunar lander. And in our cooperation, we are preparing a um, precision landing system to get to the interesting locations in the South Polar regions and also a drill, and a drill that has its heritage from the ExoMars mission and from the Rosetta mission to get below the surface of the moon for the first time in the polar regions in attempt to search for volatiles and in particular things like water. Hi, I'm Jörn a uh, German news agency, uh, DPA. I have a question. You started um, your presentation with talking about Brexit and that you're looking into different scenarios. Could you just elaborate, elaborate a little bit on that? What kind of scenarios are these? Well, as we don't know what will really happen, I mean, I'm always uh, in contact also with our British colleagues, with the uh, UK Space Agency and uh, with Dave. We have also first-hand information also what is going on. And even yesterday night we had an interaction. Because nobody knows exactly what will be the, uh, the outcome, uh, we have to consider different scenarios. So a hard Brexit, a soft Brexit, uh, and a non-Brexit. As I said, the most important thing for me was at the beginning that UK clearly said very early, even before the referendum, that whatever the referendum would say, UK will remain in either member state. And this is good. So this is good. And therefore, we have no intention at all to reduce our activities with UK. No intention at all. We have Exat uh, near Oxford, one of our sites. And we, we will have it in the future. We have to tackle issues. So if you look to a hard Brexit, what does it mean for family members of ESA staff? What does it mean? So we have to look to contractors, how to, uh, what, uh, what is uh, going on with that? What is going on with products uh, which are produced in the UK and then transferred to the continent if there is a hard Brexit? So, therefore, we are looking into all of this, and we uh, had an agreement with uh, the, what is called the executive board, that means all the directors, that we will have a full list of possible things and possible solutions. And uh, I will meet the, the British minister, hopefully twice in the next four weeks, uh, to have also a discussion about uh, what we can do together. So, we are looking in all possible scenarios, and hopefully we will uh, have uh, a, simple, a simple solution afterwards. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, Peter Gutierrez, Inside GNSS. Um, we've heard recently uh, European Commission officials 
but also I think some people from ESA speaking more openly about the availability of uh, European space assets for uh, security and defense applications. But even in the, in the context of military, uh, for example, in Marseille, there was a special session on, in which that was mentioned. Could you give us an example, a concrete example, a, a real military operation? Uh, everybody has always known that GNSS is a fantastic tool for the military. Uh, what about any additional benefits of having uh, Galileo now available for the military? ESA is a European Space Agency based on the Convention of 1975, exclusively peaceful purposes. And this is really the point. <laughs> we are not developing anything for military use. We are developing things for space safety and security. And of course, I'm not, I'm not naive. Of course, it is like in other areas, you can use things for different purposes. Of course, you can use Earth observation for, uh, for surveillance. Of course, you can use um, uh, communication, uh, especially secured communication, for different purposes. Of course, you can use satellite navigation for different purposes. But we at ESA, we are not looking for applications outside our perimeter, which is exclusively peaceful purposes. Next question? Yes, yes Paola. Yes. Um, Paola Antolini, Platinum Magazine, uh, Il Sole 24 Ore. Uh, what, when uh, do we expect the result for Bepi Colombo and uh, congratulations for the electric mobility of this uh, machine? And uh, if it's possible, some more news about uh, Luca Parmitano mission, if we have. Thank you. So Bepi Colombo will not only deliver in seven years from now, when uh, it will reach the uh, Mercury, uh, it will deliver in between, of course, pictures. Uh, so, uh, but it's it's a little bit similar to Rosetta. If you look to Rosetta, it was a 10-year travel, and we got the ones who were interested in got always some results, pictures here and there of some parts in the of some uh, tiny asteroids or uh, Lutetia and whatever it was. Uh, so, for the interesting people, interested people they will get all the time results from Bepi Colombo. But the, the science concerning Mercury will really start when it comes closer to Mercury, and Mer that's in about seven years' time. So then we have the two spacecrafts uh, separating from each other, the uh, Japanese and the European, and by that um, there will be great uh, scientific uh, results. Concerning uh, Luca, the launch is planned to be in 6 of, 6 of July. And uh, right now, the planning is going forward with all the experiments, with all the definitions, etc. He will be launched uh, with a Soyuz from Baikonur. I don't know whether we can say more. Please, Dave. Uh, thank you. Well, well one extra comment. Uh, Yep. One extra uh, uh, interesting thing that he'll be doing is the culmination of a series of technology experiments we started several years ago to prepare for a joint human robotic exploration. So he will undertake an experiment called Analog One, where from the space station he will control a robotic rover back here on Earth. And this we call it an analog one because it's preparation for what we hope to do in the future where robots uh, may be controlled on the surface of the moon from the lunar gateway. So it's a technology experiment preparing for the future. Antoine Meunier, Espace et Exploration. Uh, you said that each astronaut uh, from the, the 2009 selection should fly twice. But what about the, the opportunities for Matthias Morer? He was in the 2009 selection. Uh, the, the only thing was he was, uh, how to say, in the reserve seat. But that's covered as well. 
Simon Rosé et RFI. Uh, in that matter, uh, all the European nationals have to fly at least two times. Does that mean only in the ISS, or can we imagine, imagine a, a fly in Orion or in a Chenzu? Uh, there are talks in that. Uh... Yeah, that depends a little bit on the on the the, the time scale and all of this. So. Um, we are right now, of course, the one and only destination we have really clearly defined is the ISS, but we are also in discussion with the Chinese. Uh, some of our astronauts are learning Chinese, so to be prepared. Um, and as I said earlier, we would be very happy if we can also have a seat in the Orion spacecraft. And why not having also a European on the surface of the moon? But this is, uh, we, we have no concrete um, negotiation or, or answer to that question. We are, but we are discussing it with the Chinese side, we are discussing it with the Americans um, uh, and uh, concerning the Lunar Gateway. This is even a discussion which goes beyond US and Europe. It is an international discussion. So that, that, that's open, it's open. We, we hope that we have also the possibility to fly with Orion. Uh, hi, Jonathan Amos, BBC. Won't be surprised that I have a Brexit question. Um, well, there you go. It's probably the last time I speak to you as a European citizen. Um, You're always welcome. I'm always welcome, indeed, absolutely. But um, my concern is for EU 27 citizens in the United Kingdom. Uh, a number of organisations are paying for the settled status of EU 27 um, citizens in the UK. Will you be paying for the settlement uh, status applications of your citizens that will be in the UK? I look to John Marks whether he can say some words, but for us it's clear, ESA stuff is ESA stuff is ESA stuff. Uh, that, and that is covered. ESA stuff is covered by all of these discussions. Uh, as I understood, it's not an issue at all. Um, where we have, where we might have, I have to be very careful with my words, where we might have an issue is if family, family members would also like to work in the, in the UK, but it's also the other way around, huh? UK people over here, UK people over here, stuff of ESA are covered by ESA, full stop. Um, if member, uh, family members of UK people on the continent, uh, whether they have some restrictions in working arrangements, etc., I really don't know right now, and I think nobody can answer that question because we don't know what comes out of this discussion which will happen right now. Uh, Jean-Marc, can you add something? No, I, I think the main point regarding staff is that they are member of an international uh, organization, so they are international servants, so there is no issue at all for staff in the UK. But for the rest, we have to remain extremely cautious because we don't know, as, uh, as uh, Jan was saying, what will be the output of the current situation. Uh, and then a follow-up, if I may, uh, Jan. I understand uh, OHP and SSTL have a, um, a solution for uh, March 29th and uh, the shipment of uh, sensitive payloads and the fact that the boxes are not installed in the UK and that will be done in ESTEC. Am I correct in uh, assuming... That. I'm happy if they have a solution, I don't know, but uh, I, I think concerning, again, concerning contracts which are uh, right now done, they will be, uh, of course, been done, and, and we don't, we will not reduce our activities, and now I have to be very clear, our ESA project activities will not be reduced uh, uh, with the Brexit issue. We will not. There is some discussion what happens with Galileo. That might be there. There might be something in the future with uh, Copernicus activities, whenever it is EU money. But Copernicus is also ESA money. Don't forget about that. Uh, and therefore, we, with our ESA money, we don't see any border between uh, here and UK. Right. And uh, just a request from, uh, I think, a number of people in this room. When we get to Seville in December, can we have a, a full and transparent? view of uh, what is on the agenda, a full shopping list from directors, um, and some kind of understanding of what is taking place in that room. Because, you know, in past ministerials, we've uh, sat in a room far away from the discussions with little idea. I noticed from the report that's going to be presented a little bit later that something like 65% of European citizens either have never heard of ESA 
or have little idea of what ESA does. I know you can flip that question around, but I've just flipped it that way for, for this purpose. We are the mediators of trying to explain to European citizens what this organization does. And unless we can have some view of the processes and the decision-making that is taking place, it is very difficult for us to explain to them what this organization does. So it is a plea from me, and I think it's probably shared by a number of individuals in this room who will turn up in Spain at the end of this year, uh, that we really do have a good insight in, into what the decision-making uh, process is at that meeting. So anyway. I totally understand what you are saying, and I'm really supporting what you're saying. Um, we are preparing so the so-called, as you said, shopping list. For us, it's a document 100, but it is a shopping list. So we are trying to define all the ideas, the price tags. We are, since uh, nearly one and a half years now, in preparation of this. And we uh, told our member states that we will be in the time frame of March, April, in the position to give a first impression of what our proposals will be. And if I say our proposals, you know that the story is according to the convention, it's a proposal of the DG, but of course the directors are the ones um, defining and developing it together with me, uh, what we are doing. Uh, we will try to be as transparent as possible, and um, I will ask also Philippe to uh, develop together with me and the directors and program advisor um, what we can really directly publicly uh, show. It is, you, a little bit I have to, to explain that, of course, this shopping list uh, is still then at that time uh, not confirmed by the member states. Uh, and this, uh, the member states sometimes uh, like that the discussion is not already everything clear and they would like to see here and there. But uh, as I see it exactly as you're saying, that media is um, a supporter of uh, space and a supporter of what we are proposing, maybe also criticizing what we are proposing, this is also fine, but as such uh, helpful, uh, we will find a solution and we will define a, a solution that you are not uh, sitting in a black hole and waiting that sometimes something comes in at the end, so that, but that you are informed earlier about, and therefore also today, this is new, we never did that before, already um, uh, more than half a year before, tell you the main aspects of what we are going to do. Uh, and I can go in detail with each and every program if you like, but so far we do not have a written proposal for what we are going to do. This will be in the March-April time frame and then we, we, we will try to, uh, to be as transparent as uh, possible, as transparent as our stakeholders uh, accept it for us and as transparent as it is good for the process. But I understood your plea and I will take it seriously. Just for your information, before and after council, we are ready to exchange with you. We have four councils a year, uh, so we've done it in vast, and we, we organize such a debriefing from the council, uh, so you could sort of follow up. And uh, we have open discussions with our director general and uh, the team of directors, uh, which have been implemented. This is also something which is now almost systematic, uh, so it's open. And we, we will make our best to organize uh, web streaming or a transmission of what's going on in, in the room uh, in the permission of the council and the authorization of the council. So uh, there will be, uh, uh, of course, all these uh, deliberations closed as by the rule of the council, but uh, before, after, and uh, possibly uh, our presentations uh, of our director general, this will be made um, more available to you. So I don't know who was in the order, uh, but uh, we had a gentleman over there. No, uh, you you want to continue? Can, Thank can you. I just, uh, by preparing the, the ground, um, can you sort of prepare the delegations now? At the very least, we would like their opening statements to be streamed. You know, I mean, in the past, we've never, we, we don't even hear their opening statements or know what, you know, their positions are on, you know, where they are in relation to the agency. I mean, can you prepare them over the course of, of the coming months that, you know, we would like to hear their opening statements, at the very least? 
Okay, so we, we will organize this. Uh, we were actually prepared to do that. Uh, it, it's also a matter of uh, getting their consensus for that. But we will prepare that, and also the uh, the statements uh, are published uh, or could be published if they agree. So we will work on that. Yes, question yeah. is over there. Christian Schubert, um, the Frankfurter Allgemeine uh, Germany. Um, it's a question about the European institutions. Uh, it seems like the European Commission decided to establish a, uh, an agency for its space program and uh, establish it in Prague. Prague. So it seems like there's this, uh, there's a multiple a creation of multiple institutions, and at the same time you want to. Um, I, I wonder how you see this uh, this agency. Will you cooperate? Is this uh, some sort of uh, uh, competitor? And how do you see this in the, in the light of your effort to explain to the European public what what the European uh, activities are? It is clear from the framework agreement of 2004 to avoid unnecessary duplications. That is in the framework agreement, and of course uh, we keep it, and they should keep it. So the GSA is not a new agency. It exists, the GSA exists in Prague. The GSA so far is responsible for part of the exploitation of the uh, Galileo program. There might be that the European Commission is giving more tasks to them, but I don't see it at all. And this is after several discussions with the European Commission. This is not a competitor to ESA. Um, and uh, it is not a agency for uh, all European space activities, so it's not a competitor. They are, and this, if you read the um, press release of the commission towards that, it is very clearly they're saying it's an agency for the exploitation of uh, satellite navigation especially. So we are in discussion, and when I mentioned earlier the FFPA, huh? no, no, please ask. Yeah, for instance, it's uh, it's uh, organizing the uh, the use of the Galileo data, the organization with the different um, uh, operation centers and the different uh, different countries. So it's it's it's, but it's not a general space agency. And within the FFPA, which I mentioned earlier, uh, we will also uh, clearly define what is the role of ESA in the future for the European. Union. So ESA is an intergovernmental organization independent of the European Union, but we would like to be also a strong partner of the European Union as we are, and we were already in the past for Galileo, for uh, Copernicus, for EGNOS, and also in uh, Horizon 2020 and the future for Horizon Europe. We want to be a strong partner because when I say United Europe in space, and I mean it, United Europe in space, and I'm not looking forward to any new type of competition between the different entities. Of course, there is a different uh, membership, uh, but uh, we have not only um, uh, 22 member states in ESA, uh, out of which 20 are at the same time uh, members of the European Union. We have also Slovenia now as an associate member on the way to become a full member and we have um, very strong and good relations with all the other uh, state member states of the European Union. So that means in the future we will have something like 27 EU member states very closely linked to ESA plus three who are not, if Brexit happens, uh, who are not a member of the European Union, namely uh, UK, uh, Switzerland and Norway. So for us it's not, at that part it's not a shift of paradigm. Um, GSA and whatever it is called in the future, there are different naming in the, in the public. Uh, for us it's important that this is not a duplication, an unnecessary duplication, because as you correctly said, this cannot be uh, communicated to the public. And, I mean, do you agree that the structure that you describe is also difficult to explain to the public. Oh, I don't agree. I think uh, that uh, ESA is a space agency covering the different fields I was mentioning, and uh, we are doing all the work uh, successfully. We have a strong heritage of what we did, and we are looking forward to really uh, innovative and uh, challenging projects. And um, there are several 
EU agencies for defense, for now maybe also this uh, that uh, GSA is a little bit broadened in the future. Uh, I don't see that this at, at will already disturb overall. It's if the if the tasks are clear, and this is still to be discussed with the regulation, uh, then it's it's also possible to communicate. If there are if there are strong overlaps. Um, then we have an issue, and uh, I gave also in the EU Competitiveness Council, um, where I was asked to give some ideas, I, I said also clearly that we have to make clear for the public in the future uh, who is doing what. So you are right, it has to be clear, but I think it can be done clear as soon as we have the final version of the regulation and we have the agreed FFPA, then we can communicate it also all the overall structure in a, in a coherent and hopefully joint way together with the European Union. Voilà, very quickly, you mentioned this uh, good uh, new, uh, the artificial intelligence for the Earth's uh, observation. Uh, this, uh, can we know a little bit more? Thank you. So we see artificial intelligence coming in in uh, different fields. So I mentioned also for autonomous collision avoidance and concerning uh, Earth's observation and this uh, FISAT or BrainSAT. Uh, Josef can uh, give a short uh, information. Uh, thank you, Jan. Um, Josef Aschbacher. Um, yes, uh, what we call FISAT, Director for Earth Observation, yeah. Uh, what we call uh, FISAT 1, or we call it also BrainSAT, because it has a brain uh, on board, is actually quite a, a new concept. Uh, it is something that uh, you may not have heard of, I would assume, because it is so new that uh, which it was just uh, created a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, what is the origin of it? Uh, it was uh, the result of a call within Copernicus for small sat missions. Uh, this call was done at the end of uh, 2017. Uh, and in, uh, in March uh, 2018, we signed a contract with the winner of this uh, call uh, to develop uh, uh, small CubeSats, which are actually two uh, 3U uh, uh, CubeSats, uh, which are uh, linked together, so an optical link. So it's two satellites, very small ones, uh, with 3U each, uh, making 6U altogether. But uh, this uh, little brain side is actually a small Swiss knife because it does so many things. It has four sensors on board, a hyperspectral sensor, a thermal infrared sensor, uh, a passive microwave uh, sensor in L-band, and a, a radio occultation sensor for humidity in, in the atmosphere. So four little things in this uh, little shoebox. Uh, but what we added in, uh, in uh, November last year, uh, at the fee week is uh, an AI chip, uh, artificial intelligence chip, on board in addition to, this, to one of these two satellites, which will then communicate with the other. So the purpose of this brain, of this AI sensor, is to detect, for example, cloud and non-cloud areas. And if you can neglect the clouded areas, uh, you can already reduce the data rate by a factor of two. Uh, but also, it will be an element of a swarm com uh, combination of uh, communicating between the two satellites and therefore build up uh, something uh, which is an experiment for a multi-satellite uh, link of small satellites. So it's quite an experiment. It's quite uh, amazing, I would say, what, what it is uh, able to do. Uh, and the launch is planned uh, mid of this year. In the break, you, you will have opportunities to um, get back to the directors and director general as well. So we're going to um, accelerate. We've got two Peters there. So maybe you first and then Peter uh, in the back, descending. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned very briefly on one of your slides, harbor to harbor autonomous shipping. Is, that a, is there a project running uh, or is it just an idea? What kind of technologies would you be discussing? So uh, this part, I mentioned this part was part of my presentation, which is just some ideas, some ideas. Uh, but of course, when we are discussing about the Arctic region, uh, when we are talking about Atlantic and other things, um, then maritime security and uh, navigation and maritime logistics come together. And in maritime logistics, we have again, Earth observation, telecommunication and navigation coming together. And so to have really a harbor to harbor autonomous navigation is something which you can easily have an, as an idea. We are talking about at autonomous cars. Yes, you need navigation, telecommunication, and uh, Earth observation. 
we can talk about uh, autonomous uh, aircraft, but autonomous ships might be even faster to be realized. And therefore, and, but to go really from harbor to harbor, not only the offshore uh, navigation, but really going from harbor to harbor, uh, th that would be, uh, should be possible. And uh, we are trying to go through also what we call the Open Space Innovation Platform in ESA, uh, to have ideas like that um, give them a possibility in this push function, which I mentioned earlier, so that we are looking into that. But this is just an idea which came up from our side, um, which we believe uh, could be something valuable. It's not a project uh, at this time. Uh, Peter Selling, Intel Report. Two questions. First, on the FFPA, when when will we see that document completed and under current planning? I, I guess what I'm saying, Jan, is I want to go back to our, the the question from uh, FIZ on on yeah. the, so, the confusion that there exists in Europe at yeah. the Commission, yeah. at the member states about the yeah. respective roles of ESA in the Commission. So, so ESA is, is the, the the easy part of that because I got a clear man, uh, mandate from the member states um, to negotiate. The more difficult part is the EU because the EU, and I can understand that, the Commission is saying we cannot negotiate before we know what the final version of the regulation is. So and this is, uh, for me, uh, a bit uh, difficult. Um, so um, we hope that we can uh, go into that. And I'm looking to Josef. Last time the Copernicus Agreement took how much? A year and a half. Uh, it took for Copernicus only. Here we are discussing about more than Copernicus only, um, and uh, we have to be ready at the begin at in 20 at the end of 2020 or something like that. We have to be ready. Uh, so that means um, first drafts maybe at the end of this year. This okay. is something. Uh, um, so we are now c collecting inside ESA. We are col collecting um, topics. Like, for instance, what is the perimeter of this uh, FFPA? What should be covered? What should not be covered? Can we also introduce strategic activities and strategic uh, 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 agreements between the European Union and us? Or is it just a financial one? Then we need an additional one for the strategic point. So we are looking into it and uh, collecting right now. We are in the collecting phase of topics for the FFPA. And uh, that means I hope that we also the regulation might not be, might not be finalized in the next weeks that we can come to some first discussions with the European Union in summer of this year, coming to some first very first draft at the end of this year, but so that we can finalize it within uh, from now on calculated in uh, what, two years. Fair enough. Okay, I had a second question. I'm sorry, Philippe. It, it, sh it might be brief. I'm not sure. Um, first, will there be somebody around afterward who can who can uh, unpack some of the budget numbers released today? There are some interesting numbers in there. Maybe not for general session, but uh, uh, after the session to talk about uh, some of the figures that you've now got on that nice chart. No, I've got. We, we, you had it on the website too, so I, I pulled it down this morning. Thank you for that. So there we are. Uh, but just we get some details to dig a little more deeply than for in this general session after this thing on the budget. And the question I want to ask for the general session. Mentioned is, uh, this part is, does not include the industrial contributions, uh, which is correct. for us something, huh? uh, because we are managing projects where we have also industrial. Uh, contributions, but this is uh, the, the traditional way we show what we are doing. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, if you had a volume, if you had a volume for the industrial contribution, that would be an interesting addition to that graphic. But while waiting for that, my question has to do with the, with the launcher sector. Um, as you know, uh, Europe is unique in the world at, in that it depends on the commercial market for the success of the of its business model and launchers. Okay. I got. Um, that market has gone to hell in the last couple of years, which raises the question whether the European model on launchers is sustainable without massive new government aid. Uh, if you talk to the people who build launchers, they're always saying they want more money from government. That's true. My question is to the Director General of ESA, is there an urgency here uh, to the extent that Europe wants to maintain an autonomous access to space? Because you, ca you can't do it right now under the current model unless the commercial market is really big. And it's not now. So is there an urgency? And if there is, what might ESA's role be in, in addressing it? 
there was a clear decision of the ESA member states and a commitment that autonomous access to space is a high value and should be uh, uh, sustained. That is important. Now, you're right that the market is changing. The market, we don't know what the future of the market is. Uh, whomever you ask, you get different opinions. Uh, some are saying geostationary satellites will not come back. Others are saying they have to come back. Some are saying the future will be only small satellites. Others are saying, no, no, look to it. Uh, well, big satellites have some future. So it is not easy. And uh, so I think that the decision of the member states of ESA to secure an autonomous European access to space was a very important thing. Now we have to look into details. I look to Daniel. We are, we are defining different scenarios uh, again, um, in order not to be surprised by this or that, we are defining different scenarios with different launches per year. Maybe, Daniel, you can say a few words also what, uh, about uh, how many launches we had last year and uh, so what, uh, what is about when uh, we expect Ion 6 and uh, Vega C be on the market. Yes, good morning. Um, in 2018, you know uh, that we had... Neunschwander is the director for space transportation systems. Excuse me. Thanks for the introduction. So 2018, we had uh, 11 launches. In uh, this year, we are uh, targeting up to uh, 12 launches, 5 Fire and 5, uh, 4 Vegas and uh, 3 Soyuz, all from CSG. But I think uh, Peter's question was more in a prospective logic of uh, what's coming up with the uh, introduction into the market of Ariane 6 and Vega C and what will be uh, the model of exploitation of both of them. And in this context, um, maybe just to announce that we will have in 10 uh, days from now uh, another test of the P120 and afterwards we'll confirm uh, the maiden uh, flights after the CDR of Vega C in February and uh, the MG7 closure on Ariane 6 uh, mid of the year. And in this context, uh, time to market is key. So we aim at, uh, at a, a launch uh, end of 2019 of uh, Vega C to be confirmed on the Ariane 6 the target is uh, mid 2020, very ambitious, but it's clear that time to market is absolutely key in the equation of competitiveness, as is the price, of course, but also the performance you're addressing and at the end, the reliability. And all these parameters have to be taken into account in uh, solvi solving the equation. But now to your real question about what's the commercial share and the model. It has been proven again, and we, we are investigating it, that the European public funding need is lower as if we have a certain share of the commercial market. This is a European model and it's confirmed again on Ariane 6 and Vega C. Now the key question is, what is in this context a cadence in which allows us to be successfully achieving the cost reduction goals we have over time? Because as you know, the objective uh, when Ariane 6 development and Vega C were decided in 2014 was to lower significantly uh, the overall cost for the public sector. In this sense, we are assessing, we are fixing objectives on stabilized exploitations. We'll go to the ministerial this year to uh, participating states uh, in order to present them what in this context is needed from public sector funding. After the maiden flights of both launch, uh, launch systems, we'll make a key point and we'll see if the market introduction is exactly as it was planned, and then we have to adapt, uh, if necessary, the scenario. What is, of course, a continuous effort to be uh, pursued is the cost reduction. In this sense, we are already uh, preparing upgrades of both Ariane 6 and Vega C, also in a context of commercial competitiveness. Maybe in addition, we in, in, in the IMM 18, we also signed uh, a paper with uh, several member states uh, for Fly European.